Classic Books by E. B. White, author of Stuart Little, pictured by Garth Williams, Charlotte's Web. Contents Before breakfast, Wilba, Escape, Loneliness, Charlotte, Summer Days, Bad News, A Talk at Home, Wilbur's Boat, An Explosion, The Miracle, A Meeting, Good Progress, Dr. Dorian, The Crickets, Off to the Fair, Uncle, The Cool of the Evening, the egg sack, the hour of triumph, last day, a warm wind. Chapter 1 Before Breakfast Where is Papa going with that axe? said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. Out to the hog house, replied Mrs. Arabel. Some pigs were born last night. I don't see why he needs an axe continued Fern, who was only eight. Well, said her mother, one of the pigs is a runt. It's very small and weak, and it will never amount to anything. So your father decided to do away with it. Do away with it? shrieked Fern. You mean kill it? Just because it's smaller than the others? Mrs. Arable put a pitcher of cream on the table. Don't yell, Fern, she said. Your father is right. The pig would probably die anyway. Fern pushed a chair out of the way and ran outdoors. The grass was wet and the earth smelled of springtime. Fern's sneakers were sopping by the time she caught up with her father. Please don't kill it, she sobbed. It's unfair. Mr. Arabelle stopped walking. Fern! He said gently, you will have to learn to control yourself. Control myself? yelled Fern. This is a matter of life and death and you talk about controlling myself? Tears ran down her cheeks and she took hold of the axe and tried to pull it out of her father's hand. Fern, said Mr. Arabelle, I know more about raising a little of pigs than you do. A weakling makes trouble. Now run along. But it is unfair, cried Fern. The pig couldn't help being born small, could it? If I had been very small at birth, would you have killed me? Mr. Arabel smiled. Certainly not, he said, looking down at his daughter with love. But this is different. A little girl is one thing. A little runty pig is another. I see no difference, replied Fern, still hanging on to the axe. This is the most terrible case of injustice I've ever heard of. A queer look came over John Arable's face. He seemed almost ready to cry himself. All right, he said, you go back to the house and I will bring the runt when I come in. I'll let you start it on a bottle like a baby, then you will see what trouble a pig can be. Then Mr. Arable returned to the house half an hour later. He carried a cotton under his arm. Fern was upstairs changing her sneakers. The kitchen table was set for breakfast, and the room smelled of coffee, bacon, damp paster, and wood smoke from the stove. Put it on her chair, said Mr. Arable. Mr. Arable set the cotton down, at Fern's place, then he walked to the sink and washed his hands and dried them on the roller towel. Fern came slowly down the stairs. Her eyes were red from crying. As she approached her chair, the cotton wobbled and there was a scratching noise. Fern looked at her father. Then she lifted the lid of the cotton. There inside, looking up at her, was the new one pig. It was a white one. The morning light shone through its ears, turning them pink. He is yours, said Mr. Arable, saved from an untimely death, and may the good Lord forgive me for this foolishness. 
Fern couldn't take her eyes off the tiny pig. Oh, she whispered. Oh, look at him. He's absolutely perfect. She closed the carton carefully. First she kissed her father, then she kissed her mother, then she opened the lid again, lifted the pig out, and held it against her cheek. At this moment her brother, Avery, came into the room. Avery was ten. He was heavily armed, an air rifle in one hand, a wooden dagger in the other. What's that? He demanded. What's foreign god? She's got a guest for breakfast, said Mr. Arable. Wash your hands and face, Avery. Let's see it, said Avery, setting his gun down. You call that miserable thing a pig? That's a fine specimen of a pig. It's no bigger than a white rat. Wash up and eat your breakfast, Avery, said his mother. The school bus will be along in half an hour. Can I have a pig too, Pop? asked Avery. No, I only distribute pigs to early risers, said Mr. Arabel. Fern was up at daylight trying to rid the world of injustice. As a result, she now has a pig. A small one, to be sure, but nevertheless a pig. It just shows what can happen if a person gets out of the bed promptly. Let's eat. But Fern couldn't eat until her pig had had a drink of milk. Mrs. Arable found a baby's nursing bottle and a rubber nipple. She poured warm milk into the bottle, fitted the nipple over the top and handed it to Fern. Give him his breakfast. She said. A minute later, Fern was seated on the floor in the corner of the kitchen with her infant between her knees, teaching it to suck from the bottle. The pig, although tiny, had a good appetite and caught on quickly. The school bus honked from the road. Run! commanded Mrs. Arabelle, taking the pig from Fern and slipping a donut into her hand. Ever grabbed his gun and another donut. The children ran out to the road and climbed into the bus. Fern took no notice of the others in the bus. She just sat and stared out of the window, thinking what a blissful world it was and how lucky she was to have entire charge of a pig. By the time the bus reached school, Fern had named her pet. Selecting the most beautiful name she could think of, its name is Wilbur, she whispered to herself. She was still thinking about the pig when the teacher said, Fern, what is the capital of Venezuela? Wilbur, replied Fern dreamily. The pupils giggled. Fern blushed. Wilbur. Fern loved Wilbur more than anything. She loved to stroke him, to feed him, to put him to bed. Every morning, as soon as he got up, she warmed his milk, tied his bib on, and held the bottle for him. Every afternoon, when the school bus stopped in front of her house, she jumped out and ran to the kitchen to fix another bottle for him. She fed him again at supper time and again just before going to bed. Mrs. Arabelle gave him a feeding bottle noon time each day when Fern was away in school. Wilbur loved his milk and he was never happier than when Fern was warming up the bottle for him. He would stand and gaze up at her with adoring eyes. For the first few days of his life, Wilbur was allowed to live in a box near the stove in the kitchen. Then, when Mrs. Arabelle complained, he was moved to a bigger box in the woodshed. At two weeks of age, he was moved outdoors. It was apple blossom time, and the days were getting warmer. Mr. Arabel fixed a small yard specially for Wilbur under an apple tree, and gave him a large wooden box full of straw with a doorway cut in it so he could walk in and out as he pleased. Won't he be cold at night? asked Fern. No, said her father. You watch and see what he does. Carrying a bottle of water, water of milk, 
Fern sat down under the apple tree inside the yard. Wilbur ran to her, and she held the bottle for him while he sucked. When he had finished the last drop, he grunted and walked sleepily into the box. Fern peered through the door. Wilbur was poking the straw with his snout. In a short time, he had dug a tunnel in the straw. He crawled into the tunnel and disappeared from sight, completely covered with straw. Fern was enchanted. It relieved her mind to know that a baby would sleep covered up and would stay warm. Every morning after breakfast, Wilbur walked out to the road with Fern and waited with her till the bus came. She would wave goodbye to him and he would stand and watch the bus until it vanished around a turn. While Fern was in school, Wilbur was shut up inside his yard. But as soon as he got home in afternoon, she would take him out and he would follow her around the place. If she went into the house, Wilbur went too. If she went upstairs, Wilbur would wait at the bottom step until she came down again. If she took her doll for a walk in the doll carriage, Wilbur followed along. Sometimes on these journeys, Wilbur would get tired and Fern would pick him up and put him in the carriage alongside the doll. He liked this. And if he was very tired, he would close his eyes and go to sleep under the doll's blanket. He looked cute with his eyes were closed because his long lashes looked very beautiful. The doll would close her eyes too and Fern would wheel the carriage very slowly and smoothly so as not to wake her infants. One warm afternoon, Fern and Avery put on bathing suits and went down to the brook for a swim. Wilbur tagged along at Fern's heel. When she waded into the brook, Wilbur waded in with her. He found the water quite cold, too cold for his liking. So while the children swam and played and splashed water at each other, Wilbur amused himself in the mud along the edge of the brook, where it was warm and moist and delightfully sticky and oozy. Every day was a happy day, and every night was peaceful. Wilbur was with far what farmers call a spring pig, which simply means that he was born in springtime. When he was five weeks old, Mr. Arabelle said he was now big enough to sell and would have to be sold. Fern broke down and wept, but her father was firm about it. Wilbur's appetite has increased. He was beginning to eat scraps of food in addition of milk. Mr. Arabelle was not willing to provide him any longer. He had already sold Wilbur's ten brothers and sisters. He's got to go, Fern, he said. You have your fun raising a baby pig. But Wilbur is not a baby any longer, and he has got to be sold. Call up the Zuckermans, suggested Mrs. Arable to Fern. Your Uncle Homer sometimes raises a pig, and if Wilbur goes there to live, you can walk down the road and visit him as often as you like. How much money should I ask for him? Fern wanted to know. Well, said her father, He's a runt. Tell your Uncle Homer, you have got a pig. You'll sell for six dollars and see what he says. It was soon arranged. Fun phoned to her Aunt Edith, and her Aunt Edith hurled for her Uncle Homer. The Uncle Homer came in from the barn and talked to Fern. When he heard that the price was only six dollars, he said he would buy the pig. Next day, Wilbur was taken from his home under the apple tree and went to live in the manure pile in the cellar of Zuckerman's barn. Escape The barn was very large. It was very old. It smelled of hay and it smelled of manure. It smelled of perspiration of tired horses and the wonderful sweet breath of patient cows. It often had a sort of peaceful smell. 
as though nothing had bad had happened ever again in the world. It smelled of grain and of harness dressing and of axle grease and of rubber boots and of new rope. And whenever the cat was given a fish head to eat, the barn would smell of fish, but mostly it smelled of hay, for there was always hay in great loft up overhead, and there was always hay being pitched down to the cows and the ha- and the horses and the sheep. The barn was pleasantly warm in winter, when the animals spent most of their time indoors, and it was pleasantly cool in summer, when the big doors stood wide open to the breeze. The barn had stalls on the main floor for the workhorses, tie-ups on the main floor for the cows, and sheepfold down below for the sheep. A pig pen down below for Wilbur, and it was full of all sorts of things that you find in barns, ladders, grindstones, pitchforks, monkey wrenches, sennets, lawnmowers, snow shovels, axe handles, milk pails, water buckets, empty grain sacks and rusty wrap traps. It was the kind of barn that Swallow liked to build their nests in. It was the kind of barn that children liked to play in, and the whole thing was owned by Fern's uncle, Mr. Homer, L. Zuckerman. Wilbur's new home was in lower part of barn, directly underneath to cows. Mr. Zuckerman knew that a manoeuvre pile is a good place to keep a young pig. Pigs need warmth, and it was warm and comfortable down there in the barn, cellar on the south side. Fern came almost every day to visit him. She found an old milking stool that had been discarded, and she placed the stool in the sheepfold next to Wilbur's pen. Here she sat quietly during the long afternoons, thinking and listening and watching Wilbur, the sheep soon got to know her and trust her. So did the geese, who lived with the sheep. All the animals trusted her. She was so quiet and friendly. Mr. Zuckerman did not allow her to take Wilbur out, and he did not allow her to get into the pig pen. But he told Fern that she could sit on the stool and watch Wilbur as long as she wanted to. It made her happy just to be near the pig, and it made Wilbur happy to know that she was sitting there right outside his pen. But he never had any fun, no walks, no rides, no swims. One afternoon in June, when Wilbur was almost two months old, he wandered out into his small yard outside the barn. Fern had not arrived for her usual visit. Wilbur stood in the sun, feeling lonely and bored. There's never anything to do around here, he thought. He walked slowly to his food through and sniffed to see if anything had been overlooked at lunch. He found a small strip of potato skin and ate it. His back itched, so he leaned against the fence and rubbed against the boats. When he tired, when he was tired of this, he walked indoors, climbed to the top of the manoeuvre pile and sat down. He did not feel like going to sleep. He did not feel like digging. He was tired of standing still, tired of lying down. I'm less than two months old and I'm tired of living, he said. He walked out to the yard again. When I'm out here, he said, there's no place to go but in. When I am indoors, there's no place to go but out in the yard. That's where you're wrong, my friend, my friend, said a voice. Wilbur looked through the fence and saw the goose standing there. You don't have to stay in the dirty, little, dirty, little, dirty, little yard, said the goose, who talked rather fast. One of the birds is loose. Push it in, push, push, push on it and come on out. What? said Wilbur. Say it slower. Uh, at, 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 at the risk of repeating myself, 
So the goose said, "The goose, I suggest that you come on out. It's wonderful out here. Did you say a board was loose?" "That I did. That I did," said the goose. Wilbur walked up to the fence and saw that the goose was right. One board was loose. He put his head down, shut his eyes, and pushed. The board gave away. In a minute, he had squeezed through the fence and was standing in the long grass outside his yard. The goose chuckled. "How does it feel to be free?" she asked. "I like it," said Wilbur. "That is, I guess I like it." Actually, Wilbur felt queer to be outside his fence with nothing between him and the big world. Where do you think I'd better go? Anywhere you like, anywhere you like," said the goose. "Go down through the orchard, root up the sod, go down through the garden, dig up the radishes, root up everything, eat grass, look for corn, look for oats." Run all over, skip and dance, jump and prance, go down through the orchard and stroll in the woods. The world is a wonderful place when you are young. I can see that," replied Wilbur. He gave a jump in the air, twirled, ran a few steps, stopped, looked all around, sniffed the smell of afternoon, and then set off walking down through the orchard, pausing in the shade of an apple tree. He put his strong snout into the ground and began pushing, digging, and rooting. He felt very happy. He had plowed up quite a piece of ground before anyone noticed. Mrs. Zuckerman was the first to see him. She saw him from the kitchen window, and she immediately shouted for the men. Homer, she said, "Pigs out! Larry, pigs out! Homer, Larry, pig is out!" He is down there under that apple tree. Now the trouble starts," thought Wilbur. "Now I'll catch it." The goose heard the wretched, and she too started hollering, "Run, run, run! Downhill! Make for the woods! 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 Woods!" She shouted to Wilbur, "They'll never, 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 never catch you in the wood." The cocker spaniel heard the commotion, and he ran out from the barn to join the chase. Mr. Zuckerman heard, and he came out of the machine shed, where he was mending a tool. Larry, the hired man, heard the noise and came up for the asparagus patch, where he was pulling weeds. Everybody walked towards Wilbur, and Wilbur didn't know what to do. The wood seemed a long way off, and anyway, he had never been down there in the woods. And wasn't sure he would like it. Get around behind him, Larry," said Mr. Zuckerman, "and drive him towards the barn, and take it easy. Don't rush him. I'll go and get a bucket of slops." The news of Wilbur's escape spread rapidly among the animals of the place. Whenever any creature broke loose on Zuckerman's farm, the event was of great interest to the others. The goose shouted to the nearest cow that Wilbur was free, and soon all the cows knew. Then one of the cows told one of the sheep, and soon all the sheep knew. The lambs learned about it from their mothers. The horses in their stalls in the barn pricked up their ears when they heard the goose hollering, and soon the horses had caught on to what was happening. Wilbur's out, they said. Every animal stared and lifted its head, and became excited to know that one of his friends had got free, and was no longer penned up or tied fast. Wilbur did not know what to do or which way to run. It seemed as though everybody was after him. If this is what it's like to be free, he thought, I believe I'd rather be penned up in my own yard. The cuckoo spaniel was sneaking up. On him from one side, Larry, the hired man, was sneaking up on him from the other side. Mrs. Zuckerman stood ready to head him off if he started for the garden. And now Mr. Zuckerman was coming down towards him, carrying a pail. 
This is really awful, thought Wilbur. Why doesn't Fern come? He began to cry. The goose took command and began to give orders. Don't just stand there, Wilbur. Dodge about. Dodge about, cried the goose. Skip around. Run towards me. Slip in and out. In and out. In and out. Make for the woods. Twist and run. The cook spaniel sprang for Wilbur's hind leg. Wilbur jumped and ran. Lurvy reached out and grabbed. Mrs. Zuckerman screamed at Lurvy. The goose cheered for Wilbur. Wilbur dodged between Lurvy's legs. Lurvy missed Wilbur and grabbed the spaniel inst- instead. Nicely done, nicely done, cried the goose. Try it again, try it again. Run downhill, suggested the cows. Run towards me, yelled the gender. Run uphill, cried the sheep. Run and twist, honked the goose. Jump and dance, said the rooster. Look out for Larry, called the cows. Look out for Zuckerman, yelled the gander. Watch out for the dog, cried the sheep. Listen to me, listen to me, screamed the goose. Poor Wilbur was dazed and frightened by this hullabaloo. He didn't like being the center of all this fuss. He tried to follow the instructions his friends were giving him, but he couldn't run downhill and uphill at the same time. And he couldn't turn and twist when he was jumping and dancing. And he was crying so hard he could barely see anything that was happening. After all, Wilbur was a very young pig, not much more than a baby really. He wished Fern was there to take him in her arms and comfort him. When he looked up and saw Mr. Zuckerman standing quite close to him, holding a pail of warm slops, he felt relieved. He lifted his nose and sniffed. The smell was delicious. Warm milk potato skins, weak middlings, Kellogg's cornflakes and popover left from the Zuckerman's breakfast. Come, pig, said Mr. Zuckerman, tapping the pail. Please, pig, come here. Wilbur took a step towards the pail. No, 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 said the goose. It's the old pail trick, Wilbur. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. He's trying to lure you back into captivity. He's appealing to your stomach. Wilbur did not care. The food smelled appetizing. He took another step towards the pail. Pig, pig! said Mr. Zuckerman in a kind voice, and began walking slowly towards Barnyard, looking all about his innocently, and, if he did not know that a little white pig was following along behind him, he'll be sorry, 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 called the goose. Wilbur did not care. He kept walking towards the pail of slops. You will miss your freedom, honked the goose. An hour of freedom is worth a barrel of slops. Wilbur did not care. When Mr. Zuckerman reached the pig pen, he climbed over the fence and poured the slops into the trough. Then he pulled the loose board away from the fence so that there was a wide hole for Wilbur to walk through. Reconsider, reconsider, cried the goose. Wilbur paid no attention. He stepped through the fence into the yard. He walked to the trough and took a long drink of slops sucking in the milk hungrily and chewing the popover. It was good to be home again. While Wilbur ate, Lurvy fetched a hammer and some eight penny nails and nailed the boat in place. Then he and Mr. Zuckerman leaned lazily on the fence, and Mr. Zuckerman scratched Wilbur's back with a stick. He's quite a pig, said Lurvy. He, yes, he'll make a good pig said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur heard the words of praise. He felt the warm milk inside his stomach. He felt the pleasant rubbing of the stick along his itchy back. He felt peaceful and happy and sleepy. This had been a tiring afternoon. It was still only about four o'clock, but Wilbur was ready for bed. I'm really too young to go out into the world alone, he thought as he lay down.